ahead, uh, come back together uh, for our next presentation. Um, and just to uh, share a little bit uh, with those of you that are, were in the room, um, our next presentation is actually something that is that actually occurred on the live stream that um, Dr. Rapp will actually talk about. On the live stream, um, some of our members lost audio, and immediately they went down to the transcripts. So when we're talking about designing access for all learners, even though they may have not been hearing impaired, there was an audio situation, and they immediately were resourceful enough to what, go down to those tra the transcript and the caption that we had there. So again, thank you to those in the audience for letting us know there was an audio issue, <laughs> um, and it is now fixed. Um, but again, we're just being resourceful, designing access for all, for all learners, and Dr. Whitney Rapp is going to join us um, in sharing about universal design for learning. Um, just a short little story about how Whitney actually became um, our keynote speaker. Um, Ginger Bedell and I were actually doing a pre-conference workshop on universal design for learning um, at SUNY CIT last year at Geneseo. And the student worker that came in to set up the technology just stayed and, and sat in the back and participated in the conversation with all of the faculty in the room. <clears throat> at the end of the, the session, he came up to us and he said, I was really interested in this topic. I am a math, uh, math ed major, and when I was at St. John Fisher College, I had this instructor who really encouraged us um, to think about all learners and had a course and a book on universal design for learning. And so we looked and we went and we researched, and it was Dr. Whitney Rapp. So one of our students um, from SUNY Geneseo kind of said, really encouraged me to think universally when teaching. So, and they really were excited about the topic, stayed for, for that pre-conference um, session, and because of a way that a teacher inspired that student. So I'm um, very honored to welcome Dr. Whitney Rapp here for our um, session on Universal Design for Learning. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. I really enjoyed Kim's talk and the question and answer session after, and um, I saw lots of ways that my presentation today connects with that, and then all of the afternoon sessions through lunch and into the afternoon are going to build on mine. So it's really nice progression for the day. Uh, I've been studying universal design for learning and its application in the P-12 grades for some time now, and um, for the last few years been thinking about how it applies to higher education. So I'm really happy to be here today to share that with you, talk as we work through figuring out ways to uh, provide access to all learning for all of our students at the college level too. So uh, as you can see in the session description, I, my purpose for today is three I have three objectives. Uh, the first is to provide an overview of universal design for learning. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you are just hearing about it. Um, some of you might be thinking, sit down, lady. I could teach you better. But we will, uh, within that range, hopefully learn something new today. Um, and its applications to the college setting specifically today, obviously. Uh, second, I want to outline our responsibility for providing support in courses and field-based experiences while maintaining high expectations uh, in, in, for knowledge and skill acquisitions in our various fields. And then third, I want to share um, some strategies for uni universally designed learning environments that help prepare a more diverse group of people for their chosen career fields, and we'll get into that toward the end. So a lot of the strategies I share today um, are technology-based, some are not, um, and one of the things that we'll talk about at UDL is um, always includes technology, but isn't always just technology. So. All right, um, so I'm getting there <laughs> across these three objectives today, kind of a, a stream of consciousness that I followed over the years, my evolution in thinking about this as a college professor. And uh, I'm at St. John Fisher College now. This is my 14th year there, and I was at SUNY Genesee for about five years prior to that um, before we moved. So, um, in a, and prior to that, Michigan State University. So I have several years in higher education in different types of institutions with different types of learners and studying in different majors. And uh, I've been thinking along all of those years about how to support uh, everybody in their chosen career field. So as I go through, 
Um, there should be some post-it notes that are traveling through the room. And uh, the folks that are streaming have the opportunity to type in questions. And um, so these post-its, if you want to use them or something, you can jot down questions. And if I don't get to them today, I can collect them at the end with your contact information on them and get back to you. And that's a little way to extend the discussion beyond our session today. All right. So the first thing that we really need to do is to shift our thinking a little bit. We need to, um, and this really connects to a lot of the experiences that I heard Kim talk about, need to shift our thinking from disability as a deficit to disability as a difference or as diversity. All right, and that's really shifting from uh, the medical model of disability, which views disability, it's a social construction, that views disability as something that is uh, broken or sick and needs to be fixed or cured. And we want to move away from that thinking toward a social model of disability. And the social model um, views disability as an act of one's diversity, uh, and therefore not something to be viewed negatively. Uh, this has to happen in all that we say and do, not just uh, reactively when a problem occurs, but proactively in all of our language, all of our written materials, all of the wording that we use, how we approach our teaching, and how we approach our environments. Uh, Thornton and Downs did, uh, published an article in 2010. They are at the University of Arkansas Little Rock. And they have um, talked about the need to shift this paradigm right at the root in the, disability, uh, uh, the Office of Disability Services. And they changed all of their language. They changed the name of their department to the Office of um, uh, Disability Resource Center rather than um, Disability Services so, or Support Services. So it took the focus away from students' need to support to students and their team come up with resources together that are a better match for their environment. Uh, and they changed their mission, things like that. So the whole idea is it's not just top down, but it's bottom up and from the sides and every, every which way. All right, so as we're shifting our thinking and how we really view disability from the core, we're going to shift our practice from kind of operating under the letter of the law to operating under the spirit of the law. <coughs> Uh, if we look at just the letter of the law, right now there's two pieces of legislation that govern um, the accommodations that we provide in higher education. The first is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and this is from 1973. And um, in the non-discrimination non clause, uh, it reads that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States as defined in section 70520 of the title, shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation in, being denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, or under any program or activity conducted by an executive agency, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, the second piece is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is from 1990. So some years later, um, and that is, uh, and that reads that no qualified individual with a disability shall be, by reason of such disability, excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity. So what I want to focus your um, attention to is the phrase that appears in both pieces of this legislation, and that is, be, no person shall be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of education. So Section 504 started it with anything that is federally funded, and ADA brought it to any sector. So if we are thinking about um, uh, strictly the letter of the law, what this is telling us is we can't bar anyone from applying to and being accepted to a program because they have a disability, and we have to provide their documented accommodations. If we stretch to operating solely from that letter of the law, all right, we're going to let them in, and all right, we're going to provide those accommodations, to stretching ourselves to thinking about the spirit of the law, then what we're going to start thinking is it's going to broaden our idea of what access means, to mean equitable experience and opportunity for achievement. Not just physical access, not just isolated um, accommodations, but 
equitable experience and opportunity for achievement. Right. And it doesn't mean just not exclude. It means to include, truly include everyone, not just people with disabilities, not just people without disabilities, everyone. Um, so a quote that I take from Mara sapon uh, from her book, Widening the Circle, is uh, the idea of embracing inclusion as a core value means committing to serving all students in that model over time and consistently. It makes little sense, therefore, to talk about partial inclusion, since this violates the basic principle of inclusion. Everybody, all the time, consistently, everywhere. All right, so, um, whoops. Um, important thing to say about that is that is not a promise of success. Uh, it's, the spirit of the law is a belief and a practice of equitable experience and opportunity for success. Right? Uh, it, it's presuming competence. I know they can do it, but they still have to show me they can do it. So uh, we'll come back to that thought in a little bit. Uh, what I want you to do right now um, is take a couple minutes to either um, jot down in your own notebook, um, just think about it in your head, uh, say it to somebody next to you. Um, an example of like a letter of the law versus a spirit of the law experience that you have at your institution, wherever you are, uh, whatever work that you do, thinking of some time that the letter of the law was followed, nothing violated the law, but it could have been stretched a little further to do the spirit of the law. Okay, let's pull back together. <laughs> Open the floodgates. It's a good thing. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm going to pull you back together. All right, uh, hang on to those thoughts for just a minute. Uh, we, I will have you work a little bit more with them in a few minutes. Uh, what I want to do is share some ex specific examples from uh, my experiences across the years and um, uh, things that have come to light where I've realized there's a mismatch between my students' abilities and the environment they're in so that they haven't been able to show all that they know and access as much as they possibly could access. So they come from, I started to think about this as a few different case studies and I realized that that really was limiting because there's so much more. So it's kind of lots of different things that have happened, um, overlaps um, in, in what I've done to uh, change what I do as an instructor and the impact that it's had. So let me start um, with this one. If we think about the letter of the law and that piece on allowing physical access, uh, we might make the following accommodations retroactively for a student who uses a wheelchair. Uh, we might put in a ramp. We might uh, make sure there's a working elevator. Um, we might have an automatic door where you push the button and the door opens and it stays open for a minute or so and then it closes again. Um, we might have a wide aisle in our classroom so that they can get to an accessible desk that's saved for them so that they can their uh, wheelchair fits and they can use the desk comfortably. Um, we might uh, have an accessible stall in the nearest bathroom. This bathroom here has four stalls and one is accessible. That meets ADA requirements. 25% of the stalls, which would match approximately 25% of the general population, that would be an accessible stall. Letter of the law. Check. Good. Um, uh, in, on college campuses with um, resident students, uh, accessible dorm rooms. Certain percentage of dorm rooms have to be wheelchair accessible. And um, I've even seen some folks um, allow a late pass for a student who, um, you know, no penalty for coming into class late, knowing that their accessibility within the building takes a little bit longer than someone who uh, is not using a wheelchair. So, um, again, kind of retroactive, we'll, we'll fit this out, we'll figure this out, and we'll fit it in for you. All right. So these are accommodations are a start. Obviously, the, they meet the law. They're a start. Um, the problem with them is that uh, they're separate but equal types of accommodations. And separate is inherently not equal. Um, it leaves some students with less choice as to uh, their entry, the pathways that they take, where they sit. So if you have that wide aisle that goes to the one accessible desk, that's great. But everybody else in the, get, in the class gets to choose where they sit that person doesn't get a choice. So that's not an equitable experience or opportunity. Right? 
Um, some of you came in, sat right in the front row. Some of you came in, sat right in the back row, and then everywhere in between. So you had that choice that maybe somebody else wouldn't be able to have. Um, and it also keeps the need or deficit with the individual, meaning that um, I've got this set up for most folks, and but there's something amiss here that we have to figure out. So we want to be thinking instead about going beyond physical access to that equitable experience and opportunity. All right, so here is um, how it would look with universal design for physical space. Now, this is a little bit different than universal design for learning, and I'll explain what that means. So universal if you want to universally design a physical space, you have this problem. Right? There's a set of stairs. A person uses a wheelchair. They can't use those stairs. So a letter of the law solution is to put in a ramp. So there's a ramp next to the stairs. A spirit of the law solution is to put in stairways that everybody uses together. Are those not so cool? I, I pulled this off of the internet as a piece of clip art, so I don't know where these stairs are specifically, but the first set I came across was in uh, Brussels, Belgium, when I was there for a conference, and I was just, it was three years ago, and I just, just in awe. And they're popping up more and more, and I hear more and more people say, I saw a set of those, I saw a set of those. So someday, maybe in my lifetime, they will be everywhere. All right. So universal design takes the concept of... Um, for the environment, for equitable use, everybody uses the same set. I don't have to split away from my friends and use a different chair. Everybody goes up the stairs together. They can stay together. Um, it's flexible in use, simple and in intuitive use. You approach this, you know exactly what to do, even if you've never seen it before. Um, perceptible information, so if there was any signage, everybody should be able to access that signage and read it. Uh, wrong, or, you know, if, if you are not in a wheelchair and go up the ramp, it's not going to spit you back down the stairs. You know, you can kind of just use it any way you want to use it, and it's okay. That's what the tolerance for error is. Uh, low physical effort, and it has the size and the space for everybody to approach it and use it. So those are the principles of universal design. Um, so if we were going to take that and think about that same student in a wheelchair and go beyond physical access to that equitable, equitable experience, we might do things like a step-free building. So a lot of buildings designed now are step-free buildings. Um, automatic sliding doors, which is a little bit different than the door that opens. They just slide into the wall. It's much wider space. It's easier to get through than a swinging door, things like that. Um, all of the aisles are wide enough, and all of the desks are accessible or adjustable. Um, all stalls in bathrooms are accessible. All dorm rooms are accessible. So I've talked to this uh, through with my students a lot when I ask them if their campus fits ADA. And they go out and they explore and they check things out and they write things down and they, we look at pieces of the law and they say, yes, we meet the letter of the law. But our campus is not universally designed. We have a certain percentage of dorm rooms that are accessible, but all other students get to enter a lottery and pick their first, second, third choice of dorm rooms. People who use wheelchairs or walkers do not. They get assigned to the certain, just those few 10% of rooms that are accessible. Um, and then instead of the lay pass, don't start without anybody. Because even if you didn't get a penalty for coming in late, you missed the first few minutes of instruction and nobody else had to miss. So your, your classroom community is built on everybody being there because that person might have had a really, really important contribution to make and everybody missed it because they weren't there for it. So this is going beyond access to that equitable experience. All right, so now Universal Design for Learning takes that and it applies it to all aspects of instruction and learning. Not just physical access, but physical, sensory, cognitive, social, emotional, behavioral, cultural, and attitudinal. Way beyond the letter of the law. All right, so uh, this comic, um, it's the the bird and the monkey and the penguin and the elephant and the goldfish and the seal and the dog, we'll come back to the dog, um, all lined up in front of the teacher who says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So all of these animals have amazing abilities, but not all of them can climb that tree. So if that is your access point, you're turning away people who have a lot to contribute, or animals who have a lot to contribute, and you never even got to see that or experience that. 
Okay, so uh, universal design for learning um, comes from CAST, and um, my hyperlinks aren't up here, and I would try it again, but I don't want to do that because we're good. I'm not going to rock the boat right now. Uh, but if you have these slides electronically, you can access those links, and it'll take you right to the CAST website. And I highly encourage you going there if you haven't already and read through the links on the background research, brain research, um, psychological, sociological, neurological research on um, learning and how the, the uh, ideology of the principles under UDL. So CAST starts with three main principles when you're de designing learning for everybody. And the first is offering multiple means of engagement. So not just catching students' interest, but finding ways to sustain their effort and persistence over time. Um, and self-regulating, knowing when their energy is starting to tap out, knowing when they need something different. Um, the second principle is multiple means of representation, so representing new information to folks, presenting new knowledge, uh, making sure that they can perceive it, understand any language or symbols or uh, ma mathematical um, or any other written symbols, and that they can bring some comprehension to it. So not just see it and hear it, but understand it. And then the last uh, principle, the third principle, is multiple means of action and expression. So offering lots of different ways for folks to physically express or communicate what they know and to manage their executive functions. And then uh, in 2012, my colleague Katrina Art and I wrote the book Teaching Everyone, uh, Introduction to Inclusive Education, and we presented it um, under the labels of engagement, input, output, and assessment. So it's a uh, textbook for pre-service teachers as they're learning how to design um, PK to 12 classrooms universally. And so those are the terms that we use. So if I switch back and forth between action, expression, and output, that's, that's why. It's because I'm used to talking about it uh, in a different way. Um, so a couple other things about UDL. Um, it always incorporates differentiation, but it's unique in that it's not just different supports for different individuals, so I'm gonna provide large print for you, and I'm gonna provide an accessible desk for you, and I'm gonna um, provide an alternative writing implement for you. But I'm gonna provide those options for everybody. Knowing that I'm absolutely sure this gentleman is going to uh, benefit from the large print, but you know what? There could be 10 others of you in the room who benefit from it for whatever reason. Um, and it might just be the novelty, um, which is part goes under that um, principles of engagement. So it's um, all supports available for all students. Um, some folks say, well, doesn't that mean it's just good teaching? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's definitely good practice. It's definitely good teaching. But not all good teachers are uni universally designing everything in their classrooms. Um, it means knowing your content and knowing your pedagogical methods, but it also means knowing your students and really caring that they are included. And it, know, it means knowing how the brain and body works. So UDL is all of those things to make sure that you are um, engaging in good practice. Uh, and it recognizes the networks in the brain. Uh, the recognition network of your brain uh, deals with the content, the what of knowing, what you're learning. The strategic network deals with how you're going to use that information, the how of learning, and the effective, effective network uh, deals with your interests and dispositions, the why you want to learn that. And all of those have to be engaged at once. You have to be able to access the content, know how you need to work with it, and know why it's important to learn it. So once those things are engaged, then um, learning is going to occur. When those things aren't engaged, if the content is confused, confusing, you're frustrated about how you're supposed to show what you know, uh, you're not interested in the content, you don't see it relevant to you, and nobody's explaining how it's relevant to you, then your brain is in stress. And what happens when your brain is in stress is the amygdala, and I'm going to uh, thank um, Judy Willis. I get a lot of this from Judy Willis, who is a neurologist turned third grade teacher. Uh, but also, very fascinating story. Look up some of her videos on YouTube. Great stuff. Um, but also from uh, my psychology professors uh, at Potsdam uh, when I first learned about the amygdala and was absolutely fascinated by it. And my fascination just keeps continuing. The brain is just a magnificent thing. Uh, but the amygdala is the switching station in your brain. So as input comes in, 
If you are in a stressed state because you're frustrated or confused or threatened, your amygdala will automatically channel that incoming information to the base of your brain, which is your flight or fight center of your brain. So it's going to deal with that information as if it's a crisis or an emergency, and it will either make you shut down or leave, physically or metaphorically. But they, it will, um, that information won't be retained and processed in any way that you can use it later. Um, and the kicker is that the brain, when bored, reads it as a state of stress. So when you're not engaged and you're not interested and you're bored, your amygdala is also channeling that to away from your prefrontal cortex to an area of your brain that's not really going to store that information to use it later. So frustration, confusion, threat, and boredom are all read by the brain as stress. Uh, so when the brain is not stressed, when you know what you're learning, you know how you're going to have to, to engage with that learning and you're interested in that learning, then that information gets channeled to your prefrontal cortex, which is where it actually is processed in a way that you can access it later and do something with it. That was in a nutshell. So broad strokes, broad strokes. Um, but the amygdala likes interesting, engaging, safe environments where it can participate and take rest, risks without threat of embarrassment or punishment. So if it's in an environment where you raise your hand and you get the question wrong and you're going to be penalized for that or not talked through problem solving to get to the right answer, then it is going to see that environment as threatening and not engaging and it's going to, it's going to, uh, the participation is going to go way down. Um, I've got something else, but I'm going to wait till later. Um, so UDL always includes technology, but it's not only technology. It's much more about a match between the student, the student's abilities, the student's needs and interests, and the environment around the student. Um, here's a hyperlink here, too. It's called UDL on Campus. It's part of the CAST website, and it is, it's fairly new, but it has great stuff about um, things that apply specifically to college campuses and ways to make sure that the environment matches diverse learning needs. Okay. okay. Um, now I want you to take a minute or two to write, draw, or tell a partner a brief summary of what UDL is, as you understand it at this point. Okay, hang on to that. Uh, so let's talk more about um, making those matches. So more examples of um, needs that might arise in the classroom, things that you know about ahead of time, sometimes you don't. So we're going beyond those documented accommodations. Those you know about ahead of time. Or at least a student comes up to you the first day, first week of class and says, here's my sheet to sign. Um, these are the accommodations you get. Sometimes um, wherever you are, you get an email ahead of time that says these are the students registered for your class that have these accommodations and need these accommodations. So some of those you know ahead of time. Some of them you're not, some of these needs you're not going to know until the student is in your class. Document it or not, um, you need an opportunity to get to know those things about the student. So what I do the first day of all of my classes is I have a folks fill out a little questionnaire. What are your needs? Or what are your goals for this class? Um, what, um, how do you learn best? What do you know about yourself and how you learn best under what circumstances? Um, and what are your needs? What can I do for you to meet reasonably meet those expectations that you have for the course and make this a learning environment that's going to work for you. And I take those and I essentially make a visual for myself in different categories. So folks who say I'm an absolute visual learner, um, I have folks who say I absolutely have to doodle when I draw, when I listen. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm not paying attention. Um, I've had one folks say, um, when I'm thinking really hard, I put my head down. And I'm always told to pick my head back up because they don't think I'm paying attention, but I want you to let you know that means I'm really paying attention and I'm really trying to think something through. So I chart all that for me. And so when I'm planning my class, I can keep looking at it at a glance and saying, all right, I know I need these things. I know I need these things. I know I need these things. And I don't go in and I say, hey, Jane, here's that thing you asked for. It's just available. It's just for everybody. And I find, and I ask again at the end of the semester, and I find folks say things like, oh, I never asked for all those graphic organizers, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Those are awesome. I didn't put those down as my needs, but now I'm going to mention it next semester as one of my needs because I know that worked for me. So the, the folks learn more about themselves, too, as they have experience with other people's supports. 
So here's some things that I've come across. Visual and auditory differences. Um, and in broad, very broad strokes, again, um, students who have a temporary or permanent vision or hearing loss may exhibit characteristics in the classroom that look like this. So I'm not focusing on labels. I'm not focusing on diagnoses. I'm going to focus on what it looks like in the classroom to you. Um, and uh, difficulty with reading print or reading small print or certain fonts of print um, might come up. Uh, difficulty with mobility in the space that you have. Uh, missing auditory instruction. Uh, missing um, all or part of class discussion or peers' contributions. Um, instances of miscommunication, where they thought you said to do something, you said you did the opposite. Um, I've had students who have told me that um, they're described as defiant, and really it's they're misinterpreting auditory instructions. And it looks like, you know, all the kids go up and, you know, the teacher says, line up on this side, and he goes over there, and they say, thanks, joker, get back on the other side. It's because they misinterpreted, not because they were trying to make things difficult for the instructor. All right. Um, other things, now processing differences, and this gets a little trickier. They're invisible. They're neurologically based. Uh, anything that's neurologically based is uh, impacted by lots of different factors. Diet, sleep, those are really great in college. You know, folks, great diet, a lot of sleep. Right? Yeah. All right, so they're impacted by diet, sleep, weather, climate, the clothes you're wearing, um, whether or not you are getting over an illness or coming down with an illness. Your neurology is impacted by your body and, and the environment in ways that you might not expect. Um, so it can look different. You can see a student who is on top of things and processing really well one week and not so great the next week. And you're tempted to say, I've seen you do it. I know you can do it when you try. But they could be trying equally hard both of those weeks, but there's other things that's impacting their processing. All right, so it falls under auditory processing. Uh, difficulty taking notes and listening to your instruction at the same time. Um, students might often ask for information repeated. So those are the students where you just gave the directions and somebody raises a hand and says, what are the directions? And then you give the directions again and they still do it wrong because they've misinterpreted what you just said. So uh, if that sounds a little bit familiar, there might be something going on there. Um, some visual, whoops, I'm going too fast. I'm getting really excited with my clicker. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the processing slide. All right. All right. All right. Uh, visual processing, uh, students read at a slower pace, uh, misinterpret written information, and then sensory processing, um, where sound, light, touch, smell is very overwhelming. The brain takes in 800-ish bits of information per second. So every second that you're sitting there, you are processing 800 or so bits of information. How your clothes feel on your body, all of the different colors in this room, all of the different lights and shadows, all the different sounds. There are lots of different smells. Uh, you're probably not paying attention to it. Your brain is filtering out a lot of it so you can pay attention to what you want to pay attention to. So, but if I bring it to your attention, like, how do your shoes feel on your feet? Can you feel your feet in your shoes now? That you, you weren't really thinking about them before, and now you're like, oh, yeah, not so great. And you're shifting, yeah. How your butt feels in your seat? You weren't thinking about that a second ago, and now all you can think about how hard your chair is, right? So there's some brains that don't filter that out. They are paying attention to 800-ish bits of information every second. That's extremely overwhelming. So now you want them to learn calculus. Not so much. So you're going to have to do ways that help them not think about all of that sensory information that's coming in all the time. Okay. Um, also, uh, the, those folks with sensory issues have a large personal space. Having people sit close to them will be very overwhelming. And uh, they fidget and they move around a lot. Those are the ones who are constantly aware of how hard the chair is. All right. um, and then executive functioning uh, differences. So executive functioning is getting a lot of press lately. It's a big term that's coming up. People are learning more about it. Um, one of the simplest, best explanations that I've heard about it that I got when my son who's, he's in college now, my oldest, uh, but uh, he's had a lot of executive functioning difficulties throughout the year with um, his disability. And he um, 
when I was researching things, that the best description um, that he said that we came across when we were reading things online, he said, that's it, that's it right there. Um, it's the conductor for your orchestra. So if all of your cognitive abilities are your instruments and you could play them masterfully, if your conductor's out to lunch, then you don't know when to use those, transition from one task to another, get that task started, sustain that task, wrap that task up, plan the next task. All right, executive functions are all of these different areas. This comes from Christopher Kaufman. Um, goal setting, planning, strategizing, sequencing, organizing materials, time management, task initiation, goal-directed attention, task persistent, working memory, and set shifting. It's pervasive. You do these things constantly all day long. So if your conductor's out to lunch, then this is going to affect everything you do all day long, from getting to work or school on time to being able to drive a car to being able to have all the right materials with you and your assignments done on time to hand in to the right person in the right format, the way that they like it. So um, pretty much everything. Um, folks who have difficulty in this area have a ton of knowledge and skills, but they're often seen as disorganized, not with it, lazy, not motivated. If they just cared a little bit more about how they did in this class, then their grade would be better or their performance would be better. Um, so my colleague, uh, Katrina Arndt, she uses this metaphor, and I love this one. Um, everybody has a pitcher of water, and things that you do throughout the day use up some of the water in your pitcher. Your pitcher is only so big. Your pitcher doesn't get any bigger, and you fill it with water every day when you start the day fresh, but things that you do in your life, you pour out. So some people, to commute to work, if it's long and it's frustrating and traffic was horrible and your significant other left the car with no gas in it and you are in a hurry and now you have to add that to it, so you're already frustrated. You're pouring more water out before you even get to work or school than if you get in the car and your drive is three minutes and the gas tank was full and it's a beautiful day and there was no traffic. And, and different things empty people's different pictures in different ways. So some kids, being in a crowded room, love it. Lots of people to talk to, lots of people to look at and watch and people watch. And other people being in a crowded room pours out half their picture immediately because they are using just a lot of energy to just deal with the, being in that closed in space. And we replenish our picture in different ways. Some people replenish it by being social and talking to others. Some people replenish it by putting on their yoga pants and crawling into bed with a glass of wine. And so how you empty your pitcher and fill your pitcher back up is totally up to you. And there is no right or wrong. But everybody's pitcher is different. And how it empties and fills back up. So folks with executing functioning difficulties, trying to keep track of everything that they have to keep track of in a day empties their pitcher out really, really fast so that they don't have a whole lot left to show you that brilliant cognitive knowledge and skill that they have in your, whatever your content area is. All right, and then social skill differences. These are some other things um, that I have had to talk, problem solve with, with students in my class. Uh, folks who interrupt others a lot, uh, dominate the discussion. Uh, they talk about irrelevant things during class discussion or even when it's not discussion time. Um, they lack tact, tact or other conventions when talking to critiquing each other's work or things like that. They misread body language or facial expressions. Don't cue in when they're bothering someone or frustrating someone or um, offending someone. Um, they might be very reluctant to contribute in class. And uh, struggle with speech talking out loud in front of folks, whether it's volume or w whether they can project their voice or not, or whether or not they have uh, just jointed speech, or flat affect, where it's really hard to get a read. Their affect is the same. Um, they don't seem, seem to get enthusiastic. Um, I've had students who I have um, met with to talk to say, I'm not seeing a level of enthusiasm for someone who's going to student teach next semester around being with kids. Concerns me a bit. And they say, I'm really, really excited about this. And I just really love kids, and I just really can't wait to student teach. But you don't hear it in their affect, and that is a social skill difference. So bringing awareness to the fact that I don't hear what you're trying to communicate 
so that they can adjust to um, the match in their environment. So those are some things that we had to problem solve around. And the important thing is to maintain high expectations. All right, we need to support students without lowering the bar. Uh, UDL doesn't mean that you do whatever the kids need until they get A's. That's not what it means at all. It means that you do everything you can so that everybody has an equitable opportunity to earn that A. You don't change the objective. In all of our fields, we have really high expectations for the knowledge and skills and professional dispositions that they have to have. It doesn't do anybody any good to lower those, to excuse anybody from them. What you want to do is match the environment to their abilities and needs so that they have an, a leveled playing field so that they can play and earn the opportunity to, or earn, have the opportunity to earn the A, to be successful at all those objectives that you have for them. Okay. Um, so, some things that I've had to talk through for people, figure out for myself, some myths and misconceptions around the idea of doing accommodations at the college level. Um, a colleague said to me one time that they were really worried about a student, they've been giving them all their accommodations, but they were still doing very poorly in the class and he was worried because he's not supposed to fail somebody who gets accommodations. That's a myth. Right. Um, Equal opportunity means you have, every you have every equitable chance to be successful. It also means you have an equal chance to fail. As long as you have shown that you have provided ways for that student to access the information, show what they know, and be engaged in class, they have every right to choose not to do it or to do it to a substandard level. You leveled the paying field, they still have to play. I went through this issue with my son when he was going through high school all the time. And he would come home with a very poor grade or a very poor performance on something. And I would say, didn't you get your accommodations? And he'd say, yup. And I'd say, and? I just stopped taking the test. And it was frustrating, but that was his right. So he earned that grade. It, he wasn't prevented in any way from doing better other than his choice to do it. And that is equal support, the equal opportunity. Um, so the students that I accommodate for are everywhere around the grade range. That curve is going to happen anyway. You don't have to force it. Um, the, once students are engaged and they access the information and they're provided um, ways to show what they know, um, they are going to kick it in or they're not. Um, the second myth is that accommodations are in place so students never have to do things that they don't prefer. So the accommodations shouldn't be used as crutches. I don't like to read, so I'd like everything audio, please, so I can lay in my bed and with my eyes closed and just listen to it. Okay, that's great. That's always going to be an option. I'm always going to have everything audio, too, but you, you know, if you have the capability of reading print, you're also going to be reading print because you're going to build that skill at the same time. As long as they can access it somehow, it doesn't mean they're totally excused from one way to do it. Every different way that you access information builds a neural network in your brain and strengthens it so that you can apply that knowledge to different contexts. So if you only, only, only build your audio, then when it comes to using that text in a different way or that information in a different setting, you're not going to have as complex and strong a neural network as somebody who listened to it and read it and talked to somebody about it and watched a video on it or something like that. So all the different ways for everybody, as long as one of those ways is, is a way that they can get that information strong. Um, they're also learning what needs to be in place for them to be successful and learning what their weaker areas are that they need to build on. So I'm way better at this, and I know this isn't a strong point for me, but there are times that I'm going to have to do that, so I'm going to keep practicing with this as long as I know I can get the information that I need over here through this way. Uh, and then the third one is that accommodations are a magic wand. So if you provide it, everything's going to be great. It might not work the first time. Or it might work that one week and not the next week. Or it might work for a student who has that particular need area one semester and not the next semester. So you're constantly rematching the environment and growing it and changing it. OK, um, two minutes again. Think with the, um, about a difference that a student has had in your classroom that you're now thinking about. Maybe something that I mentioned and you're thinking they didn't come to me with a documented accommodation, but I'm wondering if there's something going on that I could change to make things a little bit more accessible for this student. 
We don't need one minute for that. So write it down, share it with somebody, however you want to do it. Come back together. Everybody ready? <laughs> 